Before we begin tonight, I just would like to announce that Ambrose University is located in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot people and of Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We are situated on the land where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, which is now cal called the city of Calgary. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nations of Alberta and Region 3. This evening, we are thrilled to have two great presenters that are here tonight. I would first like to introduce Reverend Stu Williams. Stu have, has served as lead pastor for the past 14 years at Skyview Community Church of the Nazar Nazarene. He is currently a doctoral candidate studying diversity within the church, particularly ethnic and racial diversity. He also serves here at Ambrose as a sessional instructor in our School of Ministry, and I'm thrilled that he is joining us. Alongside him is Dr. Joel Thiessen. Dr. Thiessen is an esteemed instructor here at Ambrose, and he is a professor of sociology, as well as the chair of social sciences and the director of Flourishing Congregations, which is an institute within Ambrose University. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Stu Williams and Dr. Joel Thiessen. Great, thanks Marva. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be here with a, a good friend uh, and my pastor. Uh, we were students together like 20 years ago. I was thinking about this today. Um, you hung around the pool table, I hung around the library, <laughs> so we didn't see each other as much, but uh, it's an honor to be alongside you, uh, friend and pastor, uh, this evening. Uh, tonight, uh, one of the things that we want to engage in a conversation about is how might those in church community strengthen their capacity to listen to, to embrace, and to love those whom they are different from? And as you and I were talking about this, one of the things that we spoke of was um, how so oftentimes when we talk about diversity, people tend to automatically talk about racial and ethnic diversity as kind of the only or primary mm -hmm. way with which we think about this term. And certainly it's a helpful concept to keep in mind. But I think sociologically, and, and we'll talk about theologically and practically as well, uh, the idea of diversity is much broader than that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we want to lean into in our conversation tonight about um, things like political diversity. I mean, think about those who sit beside you in your church. Mm. Do they vote conservative? Do they vote NDP? And how do we get along together? <laughs> what is the ideal in this regard? Uh, to think about socioeconomic diversity. Uh, theological diversity, some of those we were talking about, you said is a really important thing. Uh, age diversity, different mm. life stages. Uh, racial diversity. Uh, personality diversity. Uh, different physical and mental abilities within a congregation. So when we talk about diversity, we think it's really important as we answer to this conversation to think about a multitude of ways that we shouldn't simply reduce it to racial diversity, as important as that is, as one particular uh, dynamic to our, our conversation. So mm -hmm. as we enter into this, uh, Stu, uh, I wonder if uh, you could just kick us off by telling us why this topic matters so much to you. Well, uh, I think it's two primary reasons it really motivates me in this way. Um, the first is that I was born and raised in a segregated culture and society in South Africa. So as a person of color, I grew up with um, daily reminders that there were certain places I could go and couldn't go. <laughs> and um, that kind of reality obviously affects you as a person. But what was significant for me, Joel, growing up in South Africa is the fact that the church reflected the same reality in the broader culture. And so in some sense, the church itself was segregated. We worshiped with people who looked like we do. And uh, we were technically not allowed to be in certain places or communities or churches based upon, you know, our color, et cetera, and so on. Um, the second thing that motivates my interest is when I moved here, did some studies, became a pastor of a church eventually, uh, the church was primarily a Euro-Canadian church, and I'm a person of color. And uh, over the last, I would say, five, six years, you could probably correct me, your memory is better on this, um, the church really started to change. We became much more diverse, not just racially or ethnically, uh, but socioeconomically. Uh, we started to see people from different parts of uh, the community come that hadn't been a part of the church before. And along with that, immigrants, people that's 
English is not a first language. Um, and we started to recognize as leadership within our church that one of the more pressing challenges for us moving forward is how do we hold together as a church while making room for people from various different uh, you know, places in the world, uh, people uh, you have different perspectives perhaps, uh, some of them come with even different theological uh, traditions. Uh, and so that's kind of the two pivoting uh, motivations for me to kind of talk about the specific subject. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that really excites me about this conversation is the opportunity to bridge together uh, some sociological work as a social scientist, uh, leading into some of your own theological formation, and then some of the practical experiences that you as a pastor, uh, even as a lay member, and someone who works with churches across the country to, to bring into this conversation. And I thought a helpful way of beginning is to consider how we might think about diversity from a theological framework. And so I wonder if you can maybe set the table and the picture for us in that regard, and then I'll pick it up and talk about uh, some of the sociological insights for thinking about this topic of diversity. Yeah, I, I'll give it a shot. Um, I, I preface what I say in the following way. This is a theological perspective of diversity, not the only theological perspective. Um, and I think it's important that whenever we think about who we ought to be as the church, that we begin with perhaps a, a consideration of who God is. So the starting point for consideration of a theology of diversity is the God of Scripture, the Judeo-Christian God of Scripture. And the interesting thing, of course, is, is that when you study Scripture, we kind of get the sense that God reveals himself to us. Uh, we use the word, the language of Trinity you know, as Father, Son, and Spirit. And the distinctive persons in the Trinity help us to apprehend in some part who God is, but it's their interrelatedness, their connectedness, mm -hmm. the way in which the Spirit relates to the Son, the Son to the Spirit, the Father to the Son, that actually gives us a, a bigger perspective of who God is. Mm -hmm. And so even within the Godhead, uh, and I'm, I'm sounding way smarter than I, I, I really am. But I think within the God in itself, there is this idea that the diversity of persons reveals more of who God is, does not detract from who God is. Mm. So if we begin with the theology of diversity, we're beginning with this idea that God actually reveals himself to us in this kind of multifaceted way so that we can apprehend who he is. And I think what is really important in that is that good you know, study of scripture means that we don't dissolve God into this kind of indistinguishable entity. We realize that through the interplay of the Father, Son, and Spirit as revealed through scripture, we see God more fully. Mm. Now, the second part of that is as image bearers, you know, uh, of, of this God that we are seeking to understand theologically, um, we apprehend him through the diversity in the Godhead, but we also make him known through diversity of persons. So people, when they speak to me and they hear, okay, this is your interest, you know, we don't understand why you're interested in this. You're a man of color, you come from South Africa, yeah, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is that the scripture seems to be very much uh, painting for us a picture that not only does God make himself known in this Trinitarian way, but God uses us as human beings in our diversity, in our uniqueness to make him known throughout the world. So for example, when we think about um, diversity, it's, it's and, and I have a high regard for sociological analysis and study, um, it is not that's not the primary motivation that we're becoming globalized, you know, that where our neighborhoods are becoming more diverse. The, the, the real aim of the church for me is not just to kind of apprehend a, a social reality that we have to respond to, but to actually ask, how does God view diversity and how does God want diversity to make him known? So that's kind of the aim. Yeah. Diversity becomes kind of the means or a medium to such an end. So when you look at Acts and you see the Holy Spirit come and fill those disciples with uh, power to speak in diverse tongues, uh, it's kind of interesting to think of that in terms of what I've just said, because instead of making everybody understand one language, it seems that the Spirit's work is 
to empower people to share this in a diversity of tongue. Mm -hmm. And I know I only have a few minutes left, so I'll just say no, this. Good. I think Pentecost is the undoing of Babel. In Babel in the Old Testament, we have this unified effort to ascend to the heavens with one language. Pentecost is this redistribution of the spirit to empower many languages so that the kingdom of God extends outward. And so we have this kind of theology of diversity that first of all is formed within an understanding of who God is, and second, how God chooses to make himself known through us. Um, I think I have one more thing to add here. So let me just flip my page. Yeah. I think, do I have time to Yeah, add go it? for it. Okay. You're not going to say no. No, yeah. well, it's too late for that. <laughs> uh, I think that I would say that uh, essentially then diversity is not a barrier, which is very much the fear of a lot of people. That diver diversity makes it harder for us to apprehend who God is. As in the biblical perspective says to us, not only is it necessary, but it is a means through which God can be more fully known. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, is that intercultural ministry, um, as I look at our context, uh, I believe that churches like the church I pastor have a unique opportunity to manifest, to bear witness to the God that we all uh, want to worship and serve and live, live out his faith in this world. I, I think we have a unique opportunity to incarnate what has yet to be seen fully in our world when we learn to hold together learn to work together, learn to figure out what it means to be in relationship with people that are different than us. So, yeah. I uh, just think sociologically, when you're talking about uh, the ways in which uh, the Spirit of God is empowered in and through diverse communities, right. and thinking about the ways in which we either facilitate or hinder that kind of manifestation of those diverse um, uh, gifts, and abilities in and through the community of uh, community of faith. Yeah. And I think uh, this is something we want to keep in mind as we continue in the conversation again, that there are different forms of diversity. Absolutely. We're talking about racial diversity. We're talking about gender diversity. We're talking about socioeconomic, about um, physical and mental abilities and disabilities and so forth, and how those different gifts can actually edify the community. Absolutely. And how the social structures of society and of a congregation can actually help or, uh, or hinder those things. Uh, in and through my own work as a, as a sociologist, um, a lot of research, of course, on, on this broad conversation of, of diversity. I want to say a, a few things that maybe helps us to uh, paint a bit of the landscape then for how this theological orientation perhaps plays out or not within uh, these, these church settings. So the first thing I would say in terms of how sociologists measure diversity, mm -hmm. uh, generally uh, sociologists of religion will say that a congregation is diverse when no single community or, or kind of constituency within that group constitutes more than 80% of the members of that community. It's a fairly arbitrary term, it's fairly subjective, but fairly widely held within sociology of religion, such that uh, if you have, say, a, a racial group, for example, that constitutes more than 80%, we would say this is not um, a diverse community. So 80%, kind of that threshold. Most congregations are not diverse. When you look at the different um, demographics in, in congregational settings, most are not diverse. They're fairly homogeneous when you look at things in particular related to race, social class, political perspectives. People tend to congregate and gather with others who are like themselves. Then there are some congregations that are demographically diverse. You do have a good mixture of uh, different perspectives and vantage points and age groups and racial groups, etc. And yet in practice, they function fairly uh, in kind of a homogeneous way. Right. And by that, I mean that um, groups tend to retreat into subgroups with others who are like themselves. And so uh, I'm doing a, a big case study project right now of a, a church here in the city. And it's interesting, you see all this racial diversity, age diversity across the congregation, but then you look and see who's interacting with who. And you'll find uh, members of this racial group are all together in this context, and young folks are all together in this context, and so forth. And so while demographically they might appear to be diverse, 
in practice, mm. there isn't a lot of actual intermingling between the different groups. And so uh, this raises a really important sociological question for me as, um, are such groups actually diverse if they're diverse in demographics alone? Right. Is it something more than that that contributes to our sociological and theological and, and practical experience of that? And so I think about some practical questions for all of us and those who are, are watching to think about these questions in your own context for yourself, for those in your own church setting. Where do you sit in your church services? And who sits around you relative to diversity of perspectives? Do you try to stay away from those who you know are of a different political persuasion, age context, racial context, and so forth? Who is part of our social circle in our congregational settings? Who are we rubbing shoulders with in our midweek programs? Who are we volunteering alongside? Uh, and all these kinds of questions, I think, help to take us beyond just a demographic descriptor to kind of a, a lived reality when we're uh, experiencing a diversity within our uh, congregational life. And I think that our ability to interact mm. in meaningful ways, and I would say even in our own context at Skyview that we've even come a long way, we still have a ways to go. We've come a long way in our ability to uh, meaningfully enter into the life and witness and ministry of the congregation in and through the diversity of gifts and such that, uh, that you spoke of earlier. Mm -hmm. The final thing I want to say, um, sociologically, one of the questions we grapple with was, well, why are congregations not more diverse, either demographically or in practice within those settings? And um, sociologists will talk about the homogeneous unit mm -hmm. principle, the idea that we tend to gather with others who are like ourselves, and more often than not, we do so because it's easier. Right. And we all know the examples of how difficult it is to be in community with those who are different than ourselves uh, on a variety of, uh, of areas. And this is amplified, I would say, within the social media age, uh, access to different news outlets, where we tend to uh, magnify these echo chambers in and mm -hmm. through our social media channels, uh, the news that we follow or stay clear of, that it actually creates this stronger bifurcation. And sociologists will talk about insider and outsider boundaries, mm. right? Are you part of us or are you part of them? Whatever the reference group is. Right. And oftentimes what we do is we will other the different groups. We'll create a caricature, a stereotype, a set of images that oftentimes are based on perception and not reality, in part because we don't actually know people right. who are part of these other groups. We aren't actually interacting in those different, uh, different settings. Super fascinating research came out uh, recently, a co-authored book uh, by a number of sociologists in the United States, uh, a book titled Fear Itself. And in their book, they looked at uh, a number of fears that people have and what animates those fears. And one of the central findings in their research is that those who believe they lack control hmm. or who perceive themselves to be in a marginalized or vulnerable position tend to be more fearful of other groups and other people and tend to have less trust toward other people. And so this would be kind of the, the concluding set of questions or thoughts that I would have us consider uh, as we transition in our, our conversation here. Uh, for those of you who are watching, and this is a question I ask my students all the time, how does your social location based mm. on your age, your gender, your race, your political persuasion, your theological perspective, your social class, or your physical abilities, how do those things shape your view of the world? And to what extent do your social influences, your friends, your family, the social media that you're involved in, the books that you read, to what extent do they reinforce or challenge those particular uh, perspectives and views on the world? To what extent do they actually feed into um, us othering people right. and creating these images and caricatures of creating boundaries, real or imagined? Uh, and I think these things are far too natural, if you will, in all kinds of social settings, which mm -hmm. is why I think this conversation is so important. Mm -hmm. that we actually have to think intentionally about the social settings that we're in and the narratives that we embrace within uh, those settings. 
And so on that note, uh, I'd be curious, just out of your own experiences at Skyview as a pastor over the last 14 years, um, how have you seen Skyview overcome barriers related to diversity or pursue congregational diversity in terms of our ethos and practice as a, as a congregation? Yeah, so currently, I think the last count, we have about, we're, we're guesstimating over 25 different uh, nationalities in our church. Um, COVID has kind of, you know, created some uncertainties about who we are, as many churches are kind of struggling to figure out who they'll be. But we are, by the look of it, very diverse. Mm. Um, when people outside the church, and I've just been meeting with, you know, different people in the community and asking them perspectives of the church, they would say, oh, we heard you're very friendly. Mm. That's one thing. And I think what they mean by that is we serve good coffee and we stick around and chat to people. Uh, the second thing people will say, observe about our church is they'll say, the other thing that we see, you know, is that you are diverse. And that usually is, as you had pointed out, that which can be observed fairly easily, which is racially and so on. But as a pastor who looks at our church through kind of a theological lens and being present with various different people, I think we have a lot uh, of good going, but there's a lot of barriers that still has to be overcome. Multiculturalism does not necessarily mean that you're an intercultural church, that people have a sense of power, uh, a sense of um, loyalty, a sense of commitment, a sense of being heard. I think there's two things I would say that I, are, are some of the barriers that I see is being overcome, and you've alluded to this already. The first thing is you have to close the gap between yourself and people unlike you. That's the first thing. And the reason you have to do that is not just simply to be kind and nice. It's because the gap between us and people often gets filled, as you have said, with all kinds of things, stereotypes, fears, anxieties, ideas that we hold in such a way that keeps us from actually seeing the humanity of the other person. Um, the other thing that proximity does is that it confronts the biases in you, right? So there is a sense in which when you're close enough with somebody, some of the things you've thought, some of the things that you've held is being challenged by a reality that, you know, you now are faced with a person who doesn't fit that category. I'll tell you a quick story. When I was working in a, a predominantly white office when I was still in, in the apartheid years, after about six months, my colleague, who was an Afrikaner woman sitting across from me, she looked over at me and she just said, you're not like the others. That was the moment for me where I recognized that whatever gap apartheid in the segregated culture has created, it has allowed her to fill in a perspective of who people like I are based upon my appearance mm -hmm. that was undone over time through a relationship that got close. She heard me talk to my mom and heard, he loves his mom. She heard I go to church. She was a Christian too, you know? And so this kind of idea of proximity within our church, we're trying to overcome by creating social opportunities, but also just encouraging people to think beyond themselves and kind of pushing them to the discomfort of starting relationships. The second thing I would say is this, I think we're learning that growing a diverse church takes time. Um, most people still, when we have a service after service, they're all in their own groups. <laughs> you uh, have a potluck, you know who's going to sit with who, who's going to sit with who, who's going to sit with who. And the socialization that still happens kind of shows us that we have a long ways to go. But the few people that have been with us now for a number of years, representatives from perhaps minority cultures or immigrants to our, to our community, you can start to see the change in them and in others that they know over time. And so the real challenge is not just a proximity, but a willingness to journey with others long enough so that we begin to uh, see the church in, in new ways, in fresh eyes, and ourselves as well uh, in the process. Uh, I think you have to have a willingness to be uncomfortable. Uh, people don't like discomfort. They go to church so that they could be comfortable. Mm. Uh, becoming diverse requires that you're willing to make some sacrifices and say, I'm not always going to get it my way. I'm going to have to learn to listen more than I speak. Um, 
you know, one of the things I would say about immigrant people in particular, and I know I'm speaking again out of my wheelhouse of race and, and ethnicity, but immigrant people know how to traverse discomfort. They, they know how to enter spaces that are hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who move here leaving oppression or people who move here as, as seeking you know, refugee status, they understand what it's like to live in a culture that doesn't uphold, uphold their worldview. <laughs> and they know what it means to enter spaces that are discomfort, you know, that, that are uncomfortable. And I think there's an opportunity even in proximity to learn from them as we face some realities in the broader culture that some of us don't know how to navigate. So the other thing I would say is, you know, proximity is not just about confronting our own biases, but it's also brings us close enough to learn some things we would we, we don't think we can learn. And that's the gift of diversity. You will learn things that you didn't think you need to know until you are in those kinds of relationships. And then the last thing, and I think I'm still on time, uh, is that I've also found that liminal spaces um, so for example, when people go through a setback in life or people are diagnosed with an, with an illness, a terminal illness or something like that, because of the nature of what is happening to them, some of the security and the structure that kept them from engaging with people is removed. What that does is it creates opportunities for meaningful relationship that could never have happened before. Sociologically speaking, and then I'll end with this. Yeah. Van Gennep and those guys, Victor Turner talks yeah. about kind of ritualization. They talk about the liminal space and they'll say that in the liminal space, when the boy leaves the tribe so that he can return as a man, in the liminal space is the opportunity for the reformation of community. The absence of a theology of liminality or desert or difficulties in, or a theology of suffering within, I'm going to be a little bit general, I'm going to generalize, within the Western world means that we do not see the opportunity for things to die in order for new things to be made possible in those difficult places. And so in terms of overcoming barriers with diversity, I think even in the tough places, there's an opportunity for new community to be birthed. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I mean, the sociological literature certainly affirms a number of these things. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, intentionality matters. You yeah. spoke a little bit about that earlier on. Diversity doesn't just happen by accident, right? Or very rarely does it happen by accident, and right. so communities who are intentional about that commitment. Um, uh, there's also an importance of, as you've you've referenced, of uh, entering into sustained and meaningful relationship with people who are different than yourself. Again, politically, economically, um, theologically, racially age-wise and so forth and those things require a degree of intentionality for the individual for the congregation to frame that kind of narrative Fine. and i think part of what can help people and sociologists will talk about the different social influences that can shape our thinking is that we intentionally um, read and uh, surround ourselves in environments to learn about the other yeah so if you don't know about a group and this is interesting sociologically, we have a lot of strong views and opinions about groups that we actually know very little about. <laughs> it's amazing how social media can amplify yeah. the ways in which we do this. So what does it look like to just go and read and learn about the other before we offer strong pronouncements of those things? And that combined with intentionally getting to know others can actually close the gap between uh, us and them, yeah. whoever them, them yeah. are. Uh, so you, you've spoken about racial diversity. I know one of the core values at Skyview is also uh, intergenerational ministry, another form of diversity. Uh, I know that um, diversity in terms of uh, males and females in leadership, uh, in terms of our pastoral staff, those who are preaching, we look at our board, we have racial, age, gender diversity on that. I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about how um, Skyview has come to try to navigate these other forms of, of diversity within community life. Yeah. Well, um, I think we've stumbled into some things that have worked and some things we've been more intentional with. Um, the truth is, is that uh, people want to see themselves represented in any community. Mm -hmm. And when they do not see themselves in a community or people like them in a community, it's hard for them to stay there. And so we recognized as we were shifting and changing that we didn't want to just simply put people in positions of leadership because they are different or they look different. But we recognize the importance of being intentional with developing leaders 
from different cultures, leaders that are young. So we have an intentional way of including a person that is far younger than you uh, and I'm me. pretty young though. Yeah, you are very young. Clear. Uh, on our on our church board, uh, we have uh, you know with our with our various ministries, we encourage our leaders to be thinking about how that their ministries intersect with other ministries, both in terms of age and gender and you know in in, in a variety of ways so that we are not doing ministry in such a way that kind of counteracts our desire to wanting to be this kind of church that represents a, a reality that I think is important for us. Um, I think we've also had to learn to listen well to the voices that are, don't often speak. Mm. And sometimes people who don't speak, it's not that they don't have a perspective, but within organizations, within the way that you know, organizations function, sometimes the voices of those who need to be heard is silenced by the activity of the organization or the church and finding ways to create an atmosphere, a place, a safe place for people to engage in conversations. So when we have you know, the opportunity to read things together and we ask questions, how do you see these things? Mm. What is your perspective? How We just had listening sessions. Uh, we've done this a few times as a church and some people go, just tell us what to do. Why do you wanna to listen to everybody? Part of the strategy is simply to say, we need to be able to develop the capacity to listen well in order for actually to embody something that reflects the people that are there. Yeah, yeah. It's one thing to be a diverse community. It's potentially quite another to be a hospitable community yeah. within a diverse community. <laughs> the two are related, yeah. but they are not synonyms for one another. Yeah. I wonder, and you started to do a little bit of this, both theologically and even practically in some of the experiences at Skyview, but I wonder if you can help to frame a, a theological orientation toward mm -hmm. hospitality, and we'll use it as a, a setup then for looking at some of the things we know from some of the sociological research on hospitality and, and yeah. congregational settings too. Yeah, I think I would start with just a reference to, you know, the Lucan passage where Jesus enters the house of Martha and Mary. Mm. And Mary gets, Martha gets busy with getting everything ready. And I think most of us, and I would venture to say most Western thinking people, um, we see hospitality through the activity of a Martha. So hospitality is presented to us as one, uh, we do the serving and we serve out of the resources we have. Mm. But that particular story gives us a perspective of hospitality from Mary's vantage point, which is one of receptivity and listening. Uh, there is, a, there is a, um, a sense in which Mary incarnates as well a posture that is necessary in diverse communities. Um, that oftentimes is not seen as necessary. Um, being a host, serving comes with a sense of power and control. Yeah. Learning to sit down and listen, it's not something we do well. And so I, I would say uh, theology of hospitality out of the Luca narrative is to learn how to be a host and a guest. And that's the point I'd like to, like to make. I think there's times in which we serve and there's times in which we need to learn how to receive. Um, I think there are people in our churches who are being asked to act like hosts when really they need to be cared for as those who need to learn and grow. Mm. I think there are the times when it comes to hospitality where there are people who are uh, in positions of power, authority or hosting that needs to be humbled a little bit <laughs> to learn how to receive and understand and grow. Um, in fact, I would say this, I would say a wonderful, simple way of thinking about hospitality that is not very common. I haven't come across a lot of literature on this yet, but it's to think about hospitality in terms of how the cross teaches us the, the rhythm or the pattern of Christianity. So there are some things that need to die and some things that need to be brought to life. Hospitality only happens when both those things are done. Uh, the most dangerous people in, in churches that threaten true community are those who have power, but they act like they don't. <laughs> uh, 
And I think that, you know, uh, in any given context, as a male, I could have power, but as a minority person, I may not. As a woman CEO, she may have, you know, she may have power along with other CEOs, but as a woman CEO, she may not have as much power as a male CEO. Yeah. So the reality of this idea of hospitality um, also implies that we need to think carefully about what it means to lay down the power we have, and at times what it means to be empowered to serve. Um, that's kind of a quick stab at it, but that's kind of how I would frame it for us. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, part of our work at the Flourishing Congregations Institute, where we're studying Catholic and mainline and conservative Protestant churches across the country, is to uh, try to um, examine where there are areas of, of, of life and vitality in churches. And uh, we've developed a, a construct looking at 11 different markers yep. or metrics of flourishing. And hospitality is one of those that we've seen time and again in some of our survey and interview uh, research with churches across the country. And uh, I want to I draw upon some of the things that we've written about uh, in our book uh, titled Signs of Life. And, and we talk about a, a hospital community, uh, what do we actually mean? And sociologists, what's really important in social scientific research is we need to be clear about the concepts that we're talking about so that we know how to not just measure them, but how to look for them. Right. And I right. think this is, can be helpful in church context for us to be clear about what do we mean by these key terms and ideas. So here's what we, uh, we define as a, a hospital community. A hospitable community is a parish that has found ways to adapt together and that integrates or socializes new members and new ideas in ways that establish and sustain the congregation's preferred and distinctive culture while communicating an invitational climate, end quote. And one of the things that we found time and again in our work with churches is it is kind of a, a leveling of the power, as you've noted, where some people may need to let it aside that we, we come alongside one another uh, in, in a posture that knows there's a bit of give and take uh, along the way. And uh, this can be quite helpful for people to join and to actually stay in a congregation. Uh, we know sociologically that the number one reason a person joins a religious group is because of social ties they have to that group. Not the preaching? Not the preaching, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> the preaching is one of those things that can keep them there. We got to get them through the door. I'm just joking. I'm sure Skyview, we should do a survey. We should find out. We'll test. No, them. no, don't do that. Preaching is fantastic. But those social ties are key yeah. to draw people in, to retain them. And uh, how important that sense of um, social ties and then hospitality and community with one mm -hmm. another actually are. And we know that as people feel loved and cared for, particularly if they are in a marginalized position, whether in society overall, or even within the community of faith on a variety of contexts, and when they feel loved and cared for, they actually become more engaged in the community. Yeah. And I'm thinking back to what you noted at the beginning of the ways in which the, uh, the Spirit of God animates these different giftings, yeah. and the kinds of things that we possibly miss out within a community when we don't create the venue and platform and space for people to feel loved and cared for and to actually use those gifts. And that again comes out of an intentional posture for churches. Yeah. It has to be a deep-seated commitment uh, of a, a, conscience, a conscious commitment to a radical hospitality towards the person who may disagree with me or you on a variety of uh, particular areas, whether it's vaccines or masks or um, how we should vote, or who should be in positions of leadership, all these kinds of yeah. things uh, requires a, a radical commitment. A couple of things that we've seen in our own research on uh, a culture of hospitality and hosting in particular uh, is a culture of initiative, of paying attention to the needs of others. And I think you've, you've helped us even just think of our own experiences at Skyview yeah. of, of what that looks like, um, of taking initiative to invite them into a group and this one's really stands out to me of providing cover for possible embarrassment as people learn the social norms and cues of the group. What does it mean to welcome newcomers where they may not know the social norms and customs and to not alienate them, make them feel uh, like an outsider or to other them in intentional or unintentional ways. And as we do these things, and I'll conclude with this and then we'll transition to uh, kind of our final uh, conversation point 
is, uh, is thinking about the ways in which uh, we actually enact hospitality. And here's uh, one of the things that we say in, uh, in our book. We know that what feels hospitable to one person may not have the same effect on others. So generous hospitality creates a new golden rule. Do hospitality unto others as they would prefer. <laughs> and I think that's super helpful because we tend to communicate and convey hospitality in the ways that we want it to be done unto us. But I think hospitality towards a diverse community and in a diverse community starts with the posture of what does that actually look like through your lens? Right. And taking that posture to actually listen and learn within, within that setting. And so this brings us to the final question, and then we'll open it up for some questions. And, and those of you who are watching, if uh, questions have come to mind as you're hearing and thinking about some of the things that we're talking about tonight, feel free to uh, insert those in the, uh, in the chat box, and then we'll, uh, we'll work our way through some of those. Looking forward to some of those uh, conversation points in a moment here. But I'm wondering, Stu, from uh, your own theological reflection and practical experience, uh, if there are particular sacraments rituals or practices that allow a diverse community to come together as equals in ways that uh, people are valued for their worth and almost in a countercultural way what kinds of practices and rituals and experiences come to mind either as an aspiration or even lived practice within a community of faith at skyview oh it's a great question um i think central to the you know, to the work of the church is scripture. You know, we begin with scripture. The reality is, is that we all tend to read scripture from our vantage point. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the practices that we are trying to do better at Skyview, and we're just dipping our toes in, is learning how to read scripture together with others. Scripture sounds a lot different when you're reading it alongside somebody who comes from a different experience of life. Um, somebody who, you know, for example, is destitute or on the street hears, you know, the words of Jesus a little differently when he says, I've come for the poor. <laughs> and so I think part of learning how to become this hospitable uh, community of faith is how we approach scripture matters. It's not just what we read, but who we read scripture with. Yeah, uh, I would say that. I think a second thing I would say is that I think church leaders in particular need to learn how to communicate the gospel, not just to uh, one particular demographic, uh, but to many people. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way, that there are some people who are coming on a Sunday that does not need to hear every Sunday that they need to, lay, you know, they need to pick up their cross. There are some people who need to hear <laughs> that God wants to resurrect and empower them. Mm. And, and sometimes when we present the gospel as only one particular, you know, motion or movement, which is give up or just being resurrected, I think we miss the opportunity to speak to a diversity of people. Um, in terms of even how we approach the Christian seasons. So I have observed this, and this might be interesting to you because I've never shared this idea with you, but this comes out of my sociological observation. All right. Let's test is that, it out. Is that, is that um, Euro-Canadians respond well to seasons of Lent? And I think primarily because um, Lenten seasons invites people who have mostly power, material wealth, and comfort to live in a more simple way. I found amongst immigrants, especially those new to the country, multiple parents working to just pay the bills, single parent homes, that mm -hmm. seasons of Lent don't appeal to them. They want a service of resurrection yeah. and celebration and power. And so one of the things that we have to learn to do as we navigate being a church that kind of ministers to a variety of people is how that the Christian calendar itself can shape expectations and respond to the unique postures of people. Um, do I have one more minute? Yeah, we're good okay. on time. Okay, we're good on time. Yeah, we're good. I think another thing that we have to address in order to become both diverse and hospitable is the way we communicate. Um, you know, the gospel is that which can be seen, uh, heard, and touched. Uh, the preferred way of communicating communicate the gospel in the Western world is verbally or in writing. But in changing, and again, I'm talking about cultural difference and change, again, in those kinds of contexts, 
people listen and hear and communicate differently to their primary way. Another way of saying this is we need to think of multiple ways to communicate the same message. And we need to think of multiple ways to facilitate what we hear back from people um, in order for communities to actually make room for people who are different. Um, leadership, verbal ability in this culture means that, you know, uh, oftentimes you're the leader. But there's many people who do not speak English as a first language, for example, mm. in our church. They can be effective leaders, but because it's about speech primarily, mm. they'll never be in that position. So even creating forms of liturgy for how to lead a meeting, how to pray, how to participate or lead a Bible study can take the weight off people who feel that they need a certain acumen in their language mm. and open up the opportunity for them to participate through liturgy and forms that sustains their leadership as opposed to the charisma or the ability of the person in language. You got room for one more? Yeah, keep bringing it. <laughs> I think, too, that sacraments, um, you know, we, we hear a lot from theologians these days talking this way. They say that um, we are shaped by the things we do most consistently. I think sacraments has, in particular, the Lord's table has a unique, uh, it is a unique opportunity to shape people, um, especially in diverse communities. Um, I'll just close with this. I think we need to be intentional with the liturgy we use. That is one that recognizes the diversity and the needs of a community. And we need to practice it in such a way that those who are participating in it and serving it represents the growing diversity within our church. Um, in the 1800s, and I'll close with this, um, my wife would appreciate me referring to some history. Uh, the Dutch Reformed Church in the Cape Colonies um, was successful in um, in having many, many indentured workers and, and indigenous people come to Christ. But on the subject of participating and drinking from the same cup, they refused to do that. Mm. If we look back historically, we now believe that that was kind of the seedbed for the church not being a church that unifies and brings people together. And I think we have an opportunity in diverse communities to practice the kind of Eucharist that brings people around the table in the common faith and yet honors their diversity. Yeah. That's all I'll say. That's great. Uh, sociologically, I think about the different denominational settings that I've been in either as a, a researcher, as a speaker, a tender, and so forth, and thinking in particular about the Eucharist and mm -hmm. how this is observed in different settings mm -hmm. and how for many, not all, but for many, it is a, a leveling of the playing field across diverse groups such that you can come as you are just come as you are regardless of the diversity based on age physical or mental abilities um, one's race one's social class and that we all come as um, equals before the table yeah and under god yeah and i i constantly reminded of how that kind of uh, important ritual and liturgical practice can remind us of our place within sort of the divine cosmos right that we are not god none of us are and that we all come to that throne of grace at the table in uh, in such a way that uh, reminds us of um, our shared humanity and i think the more those kinds of rituals can actually draw us to those common elements the better um, there's lots you know, sociologically and theologically, that's even controversial about uh, the Eucharist and the table and how groups think about that and who can and can't receive. Um, but I think in, in many traditions, there is sort of that narrative yeah. impetus that, that pushes yeah. us toward that, that direction. Yeah. I, I was thinking earlier, as, as you were talking about the ways in which we approach scripture out of our vantage point within the world. Uh, it's one of the things I start when I teach my intro sociology class we talk about the social location how that informs how we think about the world that it also shapes how we approach scripture yeah that a lot of people well intentioned but i would say sociologically fairly naively assume that um, we'll use these phrases well that's what the bible says well sociologically what we're dealing with are people's interpretations of the bible and in particular, we interpret the scriptures in and through our particular social location. That's right. Such that um, men and women will approach scripture and interpret it in different ways. 
Uh, different racial groups will approach right. it differently. If you're wealthy or poor, you're going to read the scriptures differently. And how our social location, then we lay on top of the text, and then we lift out of that our interpretations of those things yeah. with a fair degree of confidence that our interpretation is the correct one. And then we use that to create these boundaries I spoke of earlier, yeah. the in-group, out-group, and we can other. No. You're not reading scripture correct. Right. You're not reading it in my lens. And I think I'm biased, of course, as a sociologist, but I think this is one of the gifts of sociology to the church that can help us to take a step back and understand how our social location plays such a profound role. And this is why I love this conversation that brings sociology and practical theology uh, together mm -hmm. to think about how these two can possibly animate uh, one another. So um, this is good, this is good. Uh, we do have some questions. I feel like I need glasses now. I said I was young earlier on and I kind of joked, maybe your glasses can, uh, can read these, but uh, we're gonna read through some questions. Uh, we know that those of you at home can probably see these questions, and so we're going to read them for our own. You can't see them. All right, we're going to read them to you uh, for your benefit and ours, and then we're going to uh, engage them. So I'll start at the top here, Stu. Uh, in the wake of the divisions exposed by the pandemic, our church is talking once again about the invitation to belong. And I would say a lot of churches are grappling with this as I'm, I'm speaking and meeting with different groups. Uh, part of this is being honest when someone says, but I no longer belong with you you think uh, differently, you've taken actions through the pandemic that I disagree with, and I hate those choices, right? I would say that we've experienced these things in our own church yeah. life, like many other churches, yeah. fraught with tension that comes with diverse perspectives here. Uh, what kind of advice would we offer? When is it better to agree to disagree or to go our separate ways? And is there anything, um, sort of any merit to arguing against diversity? So uh, any thoughts, experiences uh, out of our own uh, navigation of this at Skyview or your conversation with other church leaders? Well, I, <laughs> there's lots I could say here. I would say that, again, just going back to kind of the general principles of um, we have lost, I think, in the, in the broader culture, the ability to have disagreements in a way that uh, dignifies the other person and, mm. and keeps, our, keeps our own dignity intact. In and part of what I think um, should happen more in churches is we should be willing to actually have those conversations. We're not having them. Mm. Um, and I think we need to actually model what it means to be a community that wrestles through things. The one thing I would add, I would say that a lot of times we do not like the discomfort of not having everybody see things the way I do. Yeah. And that I would add this, I would say, um, just like any marriage requires time to learn what it means to love the partner you're with, I think churches operate the same. And people who, who kind of don't see eye to eye need an opportunity to recognize that that doesn't always mean you need to leave the church. And so how do we facilitate the kind of conversations that are hard where we're not necessarily going to find agreement and create the kind of atmosphere where it's okay to ask questions that we may not have immediate answers to? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about a book that we've been going together uh, yeah. or reading through on our board uh, by Randy Woodley and the idea that um, unity is not the same as uniformity. Right. And how do we speak about that and model that within our, our communities? And I agree with you of trying to provide spaces yeah. to acknowledge their diverse perspectives yeah. and even to give voice to those perspectives in ways that we can model the kind of hospitality that we've spoken of. Uh, again, I'll come back to social media. I think this can be one of the most uh, harmful things yeah. here. And I think it's probably both as a sociologist and as a, a parishioner, it's one of the most disheartening things when people just sort of let loose on social media that demonize the other on either end of the continuum. Yeah. And what we can sometimes do is we can uh, draw uh, large assumptions and paint everyone in the other category as right. being the same. It's a common sociological flaw that we, uh, we assume that other groups are homogeneous, they're all the same, and our groups are different. And I think we see this time and again, and, and as many ways as church leaders can try to de-escalate that in the ways in which we talk about and frame these things, it uh, can be particularly helpful uh, within these settings. Yeah. Of course, it's always easier said than done. We're talking about <laughs> theory, it gets down to practice. And this is what we were trying to get us yeah. to think about and how do we live into yeah. healthy, sustainable communities within that. Mm -hmm. 
All right, mm -hmm. another, uh, another question. Uh, I was worship pastor in a church that counted 52 nations among us. We put flags on, of each nation in this, on the stage for a season. Um, uh, one leader thought that a, a melting pot was necessary, but we saw benefit in allowing for diversity in small groups and uniformity in the large gatherings. We saw Caribbeans able to relax into their culture in a focused small group, uh, and we thought we benefited from both the coming together and the allowing to be separate at times. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? I, yeah, that's, I think that's a really good question or comment yeah. because I think that, you know, just like I said, theologically, we don't apprehend God by kind of, you know, reducing the Trinity in this undifferentiated reality. Yeah. There's still something beautiful about people learning to be comfortable in their own skin and culture. And I think making room for that within a community of faith is important yeah. because it honors God. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, so uh, can, do you have to have small groups that are all, you know, intercultural or all different people? Uh, I, I don't know sometimes. I think that we have to also recognize the unique ways in which culture do relate to one another and create the space for that as well. But where is it that we are unified? Where is it that we celebrate our collective faith? I think that's a part of worship uh, that we need to, to think about as well. So. Yeah, and it's a good point that it's not an either or. Yeah. There's a both and dynamic. And I think the caution is that we don't want to pull too far to one extreme or the other, that we right. give space. Again, that idea of hospitality, that um, we treat others as they would want to be treated almost in, in that particular space can be absolutely. particularly helpful for, for groups there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another question, uh, how do you deal with anxieties about potential disagreement when you delve deep into hospitality? How do I deal with my anxiety? Or the <laughs> well, maybe it's both end, and that, that's a good point, right? As church leaders, you have a yeah. whole set of anxieties and then trying to navigate the yeah. church anxieties. Yeah, I think, I think, first of all, I think that, you know, good pastoral care always means that you know the people that you are pastoring and leading. So from a pastoral perspective, how I approach any potential conflict and so on is I want to make sure that people know that I'm in their life as a person who wants to honor, respect and love and care for them and help them to walk in the way of Jesus. Mm. When I see conflict arising between people, the first thing I try to do is say, what is the, what is the one thing we already agreed on? You know, and, and, and most times people forget that actually their real desire, even if they are on different sides of things, is to honor what God wants. You know, and, and, and when you remind people that, hey, that person too, even though they may be wrong in your opinion, feels very much that they are trying to go in the way that God wants them to go. Now, that doesn't always result in everybody hugging and, and cheering at the end of it. But it certainly helps people to kind of develop a little bit of bandwidth, uh, a little bit of grace, a little bit of distance. The other thing I would say is we, we have a, cu a culture that responds out of anxiety. No good theology is done out of anxiety. No good theology comes from anxiety. Anxious people produce fearful, protectionist theology that says build the walls bigger and make sure we don't get influenced at all. The gospel, at least my theological tradition is, is that God empowers us to engage the world in its reality because we believe, and I'm getting a little pastoral, that greater is he that is in the church than he that is necessarily in the world. And so there's a sense in which we can engage with these issues with a sense of confidence and, and, uh, and faith as opposed to fear. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I really appreciate how you talk about those commonalities and those yeah. common elements. And sociological research uh, reiterates the closer we get to people, um, that the more we begin to see the similarities that yeah. exist between us. Yeah. Uh, and I think when you, you tie together all these areas of intentionality and moving closer toward others, that it helps us to do that. Yeah. And the more anxious we are, the more fearful we are, we tend to push back. Yeah, we want to push further away, and it actually debilitates our ability to um, understand what is common between us. And again, political spectrum, theological spectrum, views on race or social class, etc. It just provides uh, a helpful starting point. Yeah. And uh, I think for pastors and church leaders who are trying to help their churches navigate that is even a helpful starting point in question. Yeah. What are the things that are most important to us? Yeah. What are the end goals that we're trying to work toward? And to listen carefully 
for those areas of commonality that could actually bridge us together towards those yeah. things, even amidst the differences and, and variations. Absolutely. That. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one final question, and then maybe some final remarks from us that things are just percolating and standing out. Uh, is scripture selective in demonstrating diversity, for example, related to age, gender, or culture? In other words, do we set aside the patterns we see in the early church? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll try to answer it. Okay. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, uh, Scripture has a culture. Hmm. Uh, when we approach Scripture, you know, we have to also always honor the fact that Scripture is speaking at a particular time to particular people. And the basics of good scriptural study is to not go with what does it mean for me now as opposed to asking first the question of what it meant then. Yeah. Um, I think that we have to do good cultural analysis of scripture along with studying it. I hope that appeals to you as a sociologist. Absolutely. Preach. Um, I think that oftentimes what we've done is we've transported ideas from the scripture in unhelpful ways because we haven't taken the time to contextualize it. I think, too, that theology is dynamic in the sense that we have to do the work of theology for our day. Yeah. <laughs> so when we read all these great theologians of years gone past, they would say to us today, I'm convinced, are you engaging with the world as it is before you today, trying to answer the questions that it is raising, or are you relying upon what I said 50, you know, 500 years ago? Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a dynamic to theology that requires ongoing work and a respect for the context of scripture. That's the best I got. I'm sorry if I didn't answer that question. Yeah, well. no, that's, uh, that's helpful. And uh, I think it's a, a good reminder of how pastors are, in many respects, resident theologians to the parishioners, of helping us to both interpret scripture and locate it within the particular history and context, and also to locate it within our contemporary modern day setting and how these two worlds can come together. And yeah. um, oh, there's so much research we know on how biblically illiterate most in the pews are, particularly in evangelical churches, which sounds paradoxical to how we think about what evangelicals are and sort of the, the authority of scripture, how many are theologically illiterate, and how uh, pastors and church leaders are serving that resident theologian role. Yeah which is why the training and preparation is so key uh, to help equip the saints That's right. and the laity to do the kinds of things yeah. that we've been speaking of uh, tonight. Yeah. As we uh, draw our time to a conclusion, um, any final words or just kind of lasting thought that you want to leave those who are, are tracking with this conversation, uh, things that have stood out to you over our, our last hour together here? I think there's an incredible beauty when the church learns to hold together in diversity and um, I think it's one of the harder things to do today and again yeah I'm not speaking just about race um, I would say we need churches to incarnate what is not visible in the broader culture and we need pastors and leaders to be intentional in not pursuing diversity for diversity's sake but for what it will do for a world that needs to see what it means to live uh, in the ways of Jesus yeah that's great I would say that um, one of the hopeful and promising practice that I hope that um, churches and leaders and folks who are tracking with this conversation will take is uh, a deepened commitment to engage with those who think differently of themselves yeah. and to try to take a step back from the othering process, particularly when we aren't in sustained meaningful relationships. I'm yeah. amazed in my own context, whether it's with my colleagues here at Ambrose, um, other folks at, at our church at Skyview, uh, friends and family, that the closer we get to conversation with those who think differently than us politically, who have a different uh, racial or ethnic background, a different social class, uh, and so forth, um, uh, different physical and mental abilities and so forth, that it actually opens our mind to thinking differently about yeah. the world. And I think it affords this great incarnational possibility for the inbreaking of the Spirit of God into community. And I say amen to that. Man, you sound more pastoral than me. <laughs> no, I, I know my calling and I know what my calling is not. So uh, thanks, Steve. It's great to oh, be in you. conversation with you and uh, love the the dynamic flow between sociology,
theology yes. and practice. So it's good, good to be together with Thanks you. Thanks for having me. It's good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, on behalf of Ambrose University, I would like to just thank both of you, Stu and Joel, for being here uh, this evening. And way to make our alumni proud. Here we sit mm. with two of our NUC <laughs> grads who are uh, former, um, well, like we like to say, former Ambrose students or uh, from our other schools. But we are very proud of you, and thank you so much for being here. Um, if you are interested in some of Joel's writings and books, he has a number of them that are available online uh, through Amazon, as well as through our bookstore here at Ambrose. Uh, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to hook you up there and uh, put some of his literature in your hands. Next on, what's up next for our public lectures? Well, just today, we've already started planning for our 22-23 season. Be sure to be watching this month at Ambrose for dates that will be coming soon as we look to next fall. However, a pastor's conference is right around the corner. May 5th will be pastor's conference here on our campus with Reverend Dr. Daryl Johnson and Reverend Melissa Ewing. Um, it is a one-day conference that has a pre-conference element with none, none other than Dr. Joel Teeson. So be, to, be sure to check that out. We'd love to have you join us. But until then, uh, thanks for joining us uh, tonight for this great evening. And again, uh, we wish you all well wherever you are logging in from. Good night. And God bless.